So I'm not saying that this will definitely end in disaster for humanity, but we can't say that the risk of that is trivial either. In the wake of ChatGPT, and before I read anything more, can I just get a show of hands of who's heard of ChatGPT? Okay, great. Can I get another show of hands if you've been using it at all? How many of you would say you're hardcore ChatGPT users? Right. <laughs> Hello. Right, so the value add is done already. We've all heard of it, only a few of us are hardcore users. Some of us have played. So in the wake of ChatGPT, high profile figures, including Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple and Elon Musk, man who needs no introduction, called for a temporary halt to AI development, claiming the future of humanity is at stake. But critics argue with ChatGPT 49% owned by Microsoft that this is a marketing tactic by Microsoft to build hype around AI and concurrently a competitive business tactic by rival tech companies to prevent Microsoft getting too big of a head start. Meanwhile, what we really have is not artificial intelligence, but dumb algorithmic learning systems, which require immediate regulation independent of the tech companies to limit social damage. Will general artificial intelligence be developed in the near future? And should we take the threat of AI taking over humanity as a genuine and real danger? Or is it alarmist rhetoric designed to distract from the immediate harms that ChatGPT and other learning systems already pose? So we have a fantastic panel for you to hear from today and interrogate later. We have to my right, Liv Burry. She is a science communicator, host of the Win Win podcast, and one of the most successful female poker players of all time. Also to my right is Michael Woolridge. He's head of the computer science department at the University of Oxford. Then to my left, hello, we've got Timothy uh, Nguyen. He is a top AI researcher at Google DeepMind, and he also hosts a podcast called Cartesian Cafe. So we're going to go to the first of three three-minute pitches. I haven't told the speakers who I was going to call on because I wanted to keep the pressure live, which is why I'm looking at you now, Tim. Oh, OK. Go for it. All right. So uh, our, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, AI, is a uh, general purpose technology. It can be used for good or harm. And therefore, like all general purpose technologies, uh, it carries risk. And the risks carried by AI are quite diverse. And I'd like to present them in, say, four different categories. Um, first, there's behavioral risk. So that's AI doing what we don't expect it to do. Uh, for example, like a self-driving car might swerve in the wrong direction, uh, say. There's also structural risk, and that's where AI does what we expect it to do. Uh, but because these AIs will interact with the complex world around us, they might cause some unintended or unforeseen harms uh, to society at large. So for example, AI automation leading to massive uh, unemployment. Um, third, there's also misuse risk, which uh, involves humans using AIs to cause harm. So say, uh, creating synthetic bioweapons with AIs, for example. And the final risk, um, which I'll call identity risk, uh, involves AIs developing agency or self-preservation goals uh, that would thus threaten uh, our identity as human beings. So namely, um, our identity as the dominant species on Earth. And so when we look at these four risks, um, this question about the AI takeover uh, falls into this latter category, uh, which is the most speculative of them all. Uh, the other three that I mentioned uh, behavioral, structural, and misuse. Uh, they're ubiquitous and guaranteed risk among all general purpose technologies, uh, be they electricity, airplanes, and of course AI in particular. So when we look at all these risks in the way that I've outlined it, I think it's more important to uh, prioritize and focus on these three earlier risks uh, above this more speculative AI takeover identity risk category. Um, I think there's two reasons for this. Um, first, if we don't manage the dangers of AI, uh, we won't even get to the point where we have to worry about an AI takeover. Uh, simply put, we'll destroy ourselves with dangerous AI before uh, AI itself ever does. And I think the second reason is that, in my opinion, I think we still might be quite far 
away from AI's developing agency of the type that is concerning. Uh, we do have some kind of agency now with some of our systems. For example, they might be able to choose what the best uh, chess move is on the chess board or, or perhaps make the right poker bluff in, in the appropriate instances. But those aren't systems that we are, we are worried about, right? Um, uh, for more powerful open-ended systems like ChatGPT, um, there are tools, not agents, right? If you uh, leave ChatGPT to, its, to itself, it won't do anything. Um, and so I think going forward, when we think about uh, the risk of AI, uh, it's uh, more helpful to think of the risk involved with AI as tools, not as uh, agents. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. That was a really clear way of breaking it down. I'd love to pass the mic, so to speak, to Michael to my right, asking if um, you could help the audience explain or understand the difference between AI, artificial intelligence, and AGI, artificial general intelligence, just so that we can help understand when we're talking about the threats, how, what, for those of us who aren't professors, what are the differences between those two terms? Okay, firstly, speaking as a private individual, not representing anybody today. So artificial intelligence is a very broad church. It encompasses a huge range of different views about what the field is, what the field could be, and what the field should be. And really nobody owns it. And even between you know, people who externally might look like they ought to hold the same kind of views on AI actually turn out to have quite different views about what AI is and where it's going. Historically, most of the successes in AI have been on what you might call narrow AI. It isn't called that within the field, that's what the press call it, but roughly speaking, that's getting AI to do very specific things, like what those might be, might be recognizing faces in a picture or uh, translating from one language to another. That's a very impressive task, but it's just one of a huge and infinite number of things that human beings can do. So that kind of AI, that narrow AI, let's identify a particular problem which currently only people can do, and let's build machines that can do that. Um, and that's where historically most of the successes have been. But recently as AI, as we've seen advances in AI, and in particular as we've seen the emergence of large language models, which is what ChatGPT is, what BARD is, and what a whole range of other similar tools are, um, uh, they have much more general capabilities. And actually, I, we've often discussed over the last six months with my colleagues, why did ChatGPT go viral? Why was it such a massive hit? And the reason it was a massive hit, I think, is firstly, it's very accessible. You don't need to configure it. You don't need any special hardware. You just get a web browser up and point it at ChatGPT. Many of you have already done that. But then when you actually use it, it kind of feels like Hollywood AI. You just have a conversation with it. Right? And it's like the Star Trek computer. It's incredibly knowledgeable. You can ask it about quantum physics. You can ask it about Shakespeare. And it knows all of that, those things. And it seems to be very eloquent. You know, you could ask it about quantum physics in the style of a Shakespearean sonnet. And it will try to do that for you. Right? So it seems very, very, very impressive. But the point is that this is a much more general kind of AI than we'd seen previously. And it was the first general purpose AI tool that really made a big audience. So we've all been using things like Google Translate and so on for a decade or so, absolutely classic AI. You may not even have realized that Google Translate, for example, uh, was artificial intelligence, but it absolutely was, uh, absolutely is, I, I should say, sorry. But now we've got general purpose AI and it feels like general AI. So the dream of general AI is that we end up with machines which are as fully competent as human beings are, that can do the full range of things that human beings can do. And that possibility, which felt very distant just a few years ago, now feels like a much more tangible possibility because of the success of these large language models. It's still controversial about where they're going, about, what they're, uh, about whether we really are on the brink of general intelligence. And robotic AI, AI in the real world, is nowhere near the same, uh, the same level of competence as, uh, as ChatGPT is. But anyway, we've got the distinction between those two things, the general intelligence, the idea of having machines which are have something like the range of capabilities that human beings are, and the more classic thing that we did in AI, which is identify some specific task that we want a machine to do, and let's build AI to do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And then we'll move on to artificial general intelligence or super intelligence in the, the bigger chat. 
and thus the threats live. The final word from yeah. you. Okay, so I've got my pitch so it's all written out, so excuse me for reading. Um, but I'd like to start off by saying that I think the sort of dichotomy posed um, of this idea of like, you know, is this idea of extinction risk um, distracting us from the current issues right now is a false dichotomy. Because the reality is both areas of, you know, these different categories of risks are very real and potentially very important. And caring about one doesn't mean that you can't almost sim also simultaneously care about the other. Um, because, you know, whether we're talking about the harm that present day systems are already causing with things like deep fakes or, you know, online uh, algorithms on social media creating more tribalism, racism, etc. Or whether we're talking about the potential dangers of losing control or the unintended intended consequences of sort of superhuman level AI systems, we're still ultimately talking about trying to solve the same problem here, which is AI alignment. In other words, how can we make all of these different AI systems, whether they're more general or not, always do what it is we actually want them to do? And so far, we haven't come close to solving that problem. You know, like OpenAI's uh, GPT-4, they tested this thing for six months to ensure that it wouldn't say anything sketchy. But once they released it to the public in the real world, within days, they, people found all kinds of jailbreaks of this thing. Um, we started to see these strange emergent properties that they didn't predict, like the Sydney character um, that, you know, we're not exactly sure how it was prompted, but it made like blackmail threats and so on. So there, there were all these like unpredictable things, um, which, you know, I'm not saying GPT-4 itself is anywhere close to an existential risk. I don't think so in the slightest, but it shows how even that was a system that the most advanced developers in the world couldn't perfectly predict what it would do. And as these systems get more powerful and more generalizable, the harder it will be to predict what it is they are going to do. And meanwhile, the momentum of these sort of capitalistic incentives between all these different companies is pushing these companies to go faster and faster and build more and more powerful pro uh, products and release them as quickly as possible. So I'm not saying that this will definitely end in disaster for humanity, but we can't say that the risk of that is trivial either because history has shown time and time again what happens when weaker, less capable groups or entities run into more powerful groups, right? Like, look what happened to the Native Americans when they ran into Europeans. Uh, look what happened to the other, uh, you know, hominids when they ran into um, Homo sapiens. Like, didn't work out very well for them. So given the issues that we're already starting to see with our existing models, it's clear that AI capabilities are starting to develop faster than we are developing the wisdom to know what to do with them. So to solve that, we, I see we kind of got to do one of the two following things. We, uh, we either try and cap the rate of progress or we throw far more resources than we currently are into ensuring that these systems are properly aligned with what humanity actually needs. End of pitch. <laughs> Perfectly on time, by the way. Well done to our speakers. Keeping it tight. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.